Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for coming to my talk. My name is Sabine, and I'm a fourth year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. And I'm also uh, an organizer with Queer and AI. And Queer and AI is a volunteer run organization that represents LGBTQ plus people within the AI community. My research is on entailment detection. And entailment detection um, means the things that we assume to be true when we read a certain sentence. For example, if we read the sentence, John bought an apple, we assume that John owns the apple. And um, this is because of the way the concepts of buying and owning <clears throat> are defined in English and how our society defines these things. But um, today I will not talk about my research and my PhD at all. But instead I will talk about all the things that I did during my PhD that aren't exactly research related, but that nevertheless, I think, helped me with my career and my PhD ship in NLP. But first of all, I want to start you off with a story. So at Edinburgh in like um, the NLP department there, we have this tradition of uh, pizza Fridays, or we used to when uh, we were still doing work in person. We would get together on a Friday evening at around five and somebody from like either students or faculty would give a nice short talk or presentation about some non-academic topic like some hobby or research interest that they had that was like not primary NLP. And um, one time a professor gave a talk about imposter syndrome and I will like not name any names here but like she is an incredibly accomplished researcher, won like all the best paper awards, has brilliant students. And she talked about how she, since the beginning of her career in NLP, always felt like she didn't belong, like her success was just a fluke, just something that, um, yeah, she got lucky with. And she one day will be found out that she's actually not as good as anybody thinks which is exactly what imposter syndrome is about, like this feeling of not belonging, of being an imposter more or less. And this talk was very touching, how she said, how she like dealt with these feelings and how we as students can deal with them too, because this is something that can happen to you when you are surrounded like by brilliant people. And after the talk, there was like a Q&A part and one guy, raised his hand and said something along the lines, yeah, this is more of a comment than a question. This was a very nice talk, but I never had a problem with this at all. And everybody was like, uh, okay. <laughs> this is not a universal experience, but we wish it were. Um, except for like this being like a bit tone deaf to say, what this instance brought up for me was this feeling of yeah it's easy to feel like you belong in a place when you're surrounded by people who look like you who talk like you who have the same background as you and who yeah you can see yourself represented in all levels of hierarchy and this is not the case for many people like especially many women or queer people so Let's talk a bit about that. Every one of us, this is a picture of me in, in my workplace or on the way to there. So each of us has, um, holds different identities or different words that we can describe ourselves as. For example, I'm a woman, I'm queer, I'm a second generation immigrant, I'm white, I'm cisgender, able-bodied, middle-class, neurotypical, and so on. All of these identities, in some situations, award us with power or privilege. For example, because I'm white, I'm less likely to be randomly searched by the police. But some of these identities that we have can also be used against us to discriminate against us. For example, as a woman in a male-dominated workspace, I'm more likely to be harassed and uh, to be discriminated against. 
And I really don't want to sugarcoat how much it sucks to hold a marginalized identity in a hostile work environment or even in a work environment where this is just a minority position to be in. Like it comes with constant like second guessing and double standards that just your colleagues and your supervisors are not aware of because they're not aware of the barriers that you face in your life. Um, but on the other hand, why this really sucks, it also provides us with a certain insight that our peers don't have. Sorry, I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> so we have a certain insight of where systems don't work or where systems go wrong because we face these barriers and these failures of systems all the time. And then we have like these other parts of our identities where we hold a certain power, for example, by being in natural language processing or by working in a tech company where we, our position and our knowledge awards us a certain power where people just believe us when we talk to them, for example, about computer science, because we have a computer science degree, they, they'll be like, oh yeah, that's somebody who I can trust on that. And what I want to talk about this, this talk, or what like, I want to be the guiding light of what I'll talk about now, is how we can combine our insights that we have from like facing up barriers with the power that comes with being an NLP in like whatever position. And um, first of all, I want to put a huge disclaimer here that what I want to what I don't want this to be is like a plaidoyer for people with marginalized identities to try harder or to do more. There's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't deserve the same kind of respect and appreciation than your peers. And just holding a marginalized identity in a hostile space is a huge effort and you're doing absolutely amazing just showing up. So when I talk about all these things that I will be talking about next, like mentorship or outreach, this is not saying lean in and you have to like try harder to be accepted, but rather you are enough and everybody should see this. So in the next um, half an hour or so, I want to talk about things that I've done during my PhD that are, yeah, really inspired by this idea of like, how can I use my insight as a queer person, as a woman, as a second generation immigrant and like other experience that I have of like systems being broken and the power that I have as a computer scientist, as a PhD student to combine these things, to move things forward. I want to talk about outreach that I've done, mentoring that I've done, I want to talk about grassroots organizations and NLP. And lastly, I will talk about a bit, a bit about what to do when the thing that you want to exist doesn't exist, how to start a thing from scratch. So first of all, outreach. Outreach can be anything where you talk about your expertise in your research or in your work to an audience that is like not your colleagues or other like researchers. I, for example, did stand-up comedy about like the dangers of AI. I paired up with uh, an artist in a project where um, artists and scientists got together to visualize their research using artistic means. And uh, I also spoke uh, to Python programmers and data scientists about my research. How is this saving the world? How is you doing outreach good for everyone. Well, first of all, you can use this platform to raise awareness for important issues. For example, talking in form of like a comedy set about the dangers of AI can like help people to um, be better informed citizens and be aware of like, for example, the discriminations that people face from facial recognition software and that those things are not like great impartial system, but actually really biased and dangerous. Secondly, every time you 
stand up in front of an audience as a person with a marginalized identity, for example, people can see you in a position of competence and power in a sense. So when I stand up on a stand up comedy stage and I say like, I'm, I'm a PhD student in computer science and you will listen to me talk about AI for like 15 minutes or so. Somebody in that audience sees me as a woman and a computer scientist and clocks this as, oh yeah, like women are actually good at sciencey stuff. And like this can help like wear down barriers that exist in people's mind, just like one bit at a time. How is doing outreach good for your career? Well, first of all, it really helps your confidence if you like go up on a stage and see that nothing terrible happens. This can help you like find the same kind of like center of competence when you talk to your colleagues or your supervisor. Also, it helps you to learn to explain your research to different audiences and to like do this work of thinking, okay, what do the people who listen to me know and what are words or metaphors or other helpful things that I can use to get my point across. And that really helps you when, again, if you talk with your colleagues, if you talk with your supervisors, if you do a scientific presentation as well. So I've collected some resources, um, for example, uh, the place where I did the stand up comedy with Bright Club and they exist in Edinburgh, Glasgow and like other cities in the UK. Then Pi Data and like other meetups are a great place to start if you want to like talk to an audience of programmers um, where like your research can meet kind of like an application level. Then um, the arts project was, um, that's like an Edinburgh institution, the ASCOS lab, but maybe there are like similar things in other cities. So like that might be a place to start. And then two things that I haven't done myself, but that are also kind of outreach that you could do. If you're um, still a student, you can join the three minute thesis competition. Couldn't find a good, a good homepage for that, but maybe your university has like some kind of representation for that. And the other one is the Pint of Science, which is like a UK based science festival where scientists go to pubs and like do kind of uh, science education for like a broad audience. So next on, I want to talk about mentorship. Mentorship is what we, when we team up with somebody who is either more advanced along a career line that we want to take or less advanced in a career line and like meet up with them once or like um, once every two weeks or once a month or like on some regular schedule and put in dedicated time to talk about career goals and obstacles to reaching these goals. Um, I have done both uh, these mentorships where I was like the, the younger partner, so to say, like baby Yoda or, and where I was older Yoda by uh, mentoring uh, an undergrad student. And um, mentorship can be really helpful uh, to just navigate this problem of not having role models or not having representation in your immediate surrounding. So you might be like the only woman in your research group or you might be the only queer person you know at the university, but you can find a mentor that is maybe like not locally there, but that you can still like uh, talk to and share experiences with. And so this is good because it lift up, lifts up others who have maybe, who share maybe may marginalized identities with you or even not like, I mean, it is just a good way to share the experiences and the resources that you have. Another important point is um, that, especially if you have older marginalized identities, these mentorship relationships could work as whisper networks to flag abusive um, supervisors or um, abusive workplace situations and sometimes like this is the only way how this information can be passed down because institutional oversight is just lacking. So I think 
it is important, for example, to uh, have um, a higher up person, for example, um, somewhere in your in your organization that like can maybe point out like okay this person has a history of harassment so like stay clear of them so maybe that seems like really obvious now but like it is good for your career as well because like your this networking and um sharing of resources of course helps you to um navigate kind of the non-scientific side of your work like you can be really good at like the coding or the experiments and so on but like working in an environment that is not necessarily supportive of you will put up barriers that have nothing to do with this and so just having somebody you could talk to and you can work through these problems can be um, a huge benefit it also um, trains you in problem solving. For example, if you have like a mentee or like an undergrad student that, that you talk to regularly, it, it also is great to put yourself in their mind space and to figure out, okay, what are good next steps? What are good questions to ask to um, help them kind of figure out their problems? And again, it like is really good for your communication skills as well to even if it's like kind of talking about research on like a very abstracted level it still helps you to um yeah get in the habit get ideas across resources for finding a mentor or finding a mentee can be um sometimes a bit tricky so if you're still at university your careers office at your university might be a place to start then sometimes university might have like stem societies or computer science societies or like other kind of informal student clubs that organize these kind of things so if you're already out of university you can you might be able to reach out to an alumni network for like some university you've been at or for example i found a mentor through like a scholarship that i received in my master's and then like they had kind of an alumni network that was running uh a mentorship program but often these things are not available to you if you're like not in a university environment you can also like really reach out to your friends and colleagues for example somebody you know who like graduated a year or two earlier you can reach out and be like hey would you be up to talking with me about like my work stuff every other week or you could reach out to colleagues who are like higher up the career ladder but you still feel like you have um, a good way of talking to each other. So I think when it comes to mentorship, it is not even the most important part that like the person matches you like in expertise or, or seniority, but rather that you have like a good way of talking to each other and figuring out problems together. And lastly, another good source to find mentors are affinity groups. And that's what I want to talk about next. Affinity groups are grassroots organizations and NLP are volunteer run organizations like Queer and AI or Black and AI who um, like stem from the desire of people to like work on better representation and tackle problems that are um, really obvious in, in the NLP community but like not obvious to the people higher up but only to those who are affected and kind of banding together to um, fight discrimination in that way. So what you see on the right here is um, a session on diversity and inclusion that uh, I've chaired at NACL, which where we brought together people from Black and AI and Mazahane and Latinx and AI to discuss these things. And I can really strongly advise to join a grassroots organization because it gives us more power in important issues. For example, one problem that trans people in academia face a lot is that academic journals are very restrictive about changing your names in a publication. So if you sometime change your name during the course of your life, this might mean that all of your publication that you 
published before your name change are lost and you cannot like prove that you have actually a track record in publishing and due to advocating and like really reaching out to the publishers as an organization rather than like single people queen ai was able to exert the power that was needed to make um large journal publishing companies um, much more accessible for people who want to change their names and um, to to be better in this sense. Another thing is that if you are part of an organization like Queer and AI, it is easier for you to access resources because it is easier to reach out to companies as, for example, an organization saying, okay, hi, we're Queer and AI, we want to do a workshop, can you like give us sponsorship money in exchange for like you advertising there. And as I said, it's a great source of role models or mentorship because in like the Queer and AI member survey that we did, we found out that 80% of the members of Queer and AI don't have role models in their immediate environment. And having like this worldwide network of queer AI researchers actually allows you to find somebody who has like similar interests, who have like a similar identity and team up with them to be your mentor and like to just find people to collaborate with or just like build this personal network um, of knowledge and contacts that you can't find in your immediate environment. So this again can spark off good opportunities for your career. For example, Queer and AI has a mailing list where people can share um, job postings and where people share like summer schools or other projects that they're working on. And um, this way you can kind of profit of kind of this informal knowledge of having, for example, a person at a company that you want intern at and that can help you figure out um, what the requirements are that you have to fill. Um, we also, for example, Queer and AI does a lot of things like um, we have a dedicated undergrad mentorship program. We have a program for financial support for grad school application when you, for example, need to get a language certificate or you need to pay administrative costs to, to apply to university. And um, we also have a great series of conference um, conference socials where we also sponsor co like conference attendance for people. Um, I also want to borrow this amazing slide from Shakir Mohammed's uh, keynote talk at NACL 2021 where he put up uh, on a map the um, different affinity groups or grassroots organizations and, and machine learning and AI that exist at the moment like East European machine learning or Southeast Asian machine learning, Mazahana in Africa and deep learning in, in Dalba, Hipu and here at the edge, uh, queer and AI and black and AI who represent people all over the world. And I strongly encourage people to join these. Um, I collected uh, a few here and you can also find them on the Queer and AI website. Like OSTEM, for example, is kind of our mothership organization for queer people in the sciences and engineering. And there is Black and AI, Latinx and AI, Women in Machine Learning, Widening NLP, which is like, again, kind of an overarching organization um, for people with marginalized identities in NLP, then Black Women in AI and Disability in AI. For, for example, um, Mazahane and for queer and AI, I can say that ally, allies are very welcome. So like, even if you don't um, like tick the boxes in terms of identity, if you're, for example, interested in low resource machine translation, then Mazahane is still like very much welcoming your contribution. And also queer and AI is inviting allies because we need to fight this fight together. And lastly, I want to talk about what to do if the thing that you need doesn't exist. So what if there isn't an affinity group that like covers the identity that you identify with? What if there isn't a meetup in your city that um, covers your specific like research interest or a specific societal problem that, that you want to tackle? So I'm going to take a sip of water. So 
when I moved to Edinburgh, I was really struggling with the winters there because I have a se seasonal affective disorder and um, I would get really sad in November and December. And this was also compounded by the fact that um, I just moved to a new city. I didn't know anybody there and I was like feeling really down and lonely. And I found out that like making art with people and community really helped me with that and it, that it gave me something to look forward to and something that I could really identify with. And at my university there were funds for organizing social events for people um, who work in computer science. So a friend of mine and I uh, applied for this funds and we bought a bunch of art supplies and for over a year before the lockdown happened um, every week we would just put out all the art supplies and like put out this these cool protective like plastic things over the table and it was really like low barrier entry like just people could come by and sit down with us and do whatever they wanted with our art supplies so it wasn't like taught or anything it was just like grab some paint and and paint with us and it was pretty nice, like it is it established a group of like 10 to 15 people who were kind of regulars who would, who would we would always see and yeah, it, it was it was a good thing to do. So starting things from scratch is good because your needs might be shared by others. So although it was something that I wanted to do and that I enjoyed, there were like the 10, those 10, 15 people who would show up and also really enjoy it, but like they would not have uh, had the time or the energy or, or the incentive to start that by themselves. So for, because I put something out there in the world, others profited from it as well. And it was great for, uh, again, getting to know, know new people. Like I talked to like people from areas of computer science who I haven't known before or like administrative workers and which was really nice to get to know these people. And last but not least, it was fun. So, I mean, you can't work if you're totally burned out. So it's, it's also good to integrate that in your career somewhere. So in terms of resources, where can you turn to if you want to start something from scratch because what you need in the world doesn't exist yet. You can, lots of things can be done without the need of extra funds. Like if you just want to start a reading group about a certain topic, or if you want to like have a meetup for people who have like a shared identity with you, sometimes just reaching people via a mailing list, for example, if like your institution has a mailing list for people in computer science or PhD students, reaching out via this mailing list, reaching out via Meetup, which is a homepage, or reaching out via other social media can already be enough to be like, hey, let's meet up in a cafe and, and talk there, or let's meet up at like some other public space. Sometimes the thing that you want to put up needs funding because you need to say pay materials and you want to pay uh, rent for like a room where you can put up a presentation. If you are at your university, sometimes like your grad school office is a good place to reach out to or like whatever other office is in charge of like social events at your school. Then if it's something that it has to do with like a marginalized identity, sometimes you can reach out to local nonprofits that have something to do with this marginalized identity. Another thing that can work for things in computer science is company sponsorship because often companies are really interested in recruiting people or like selling their software products to other people in computer sciences or in like the NLP industry. And um, for example, like the big five, like Apple or Google or whatever, they have specific com campus outreach groups that you can like right to or like you can just team up with like some local company that you know to say like hey can you sponsor this event that we think of and like you can advertise at this event and last but not least again affinity groups is a, are a great place to get funding from if you have like a specific idea that fits with queer and ai or like any other group those groups have funds from company sponsorship and 
they are really like happy to put things up like for example this diversity inclusion panel was something that just like started as an idea where i said oh yeah we should do this and then like we collected the people and we found a platform to host this so this again might might be um a good way to put the thing that you want to see in the world into existence so i want to close here with again this is not a to-do list. This is not the things that you need to somehow achieve to be accepted in your community because you are already absolutely amazing for holding marginalized identities in a hostile environment. And the last thing that I want to say is like together we can make great things happen because we have unique insights and we have unique powers and putting those things together, I hope will make the world better. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your talk. It's very, uh, very important and it's full of very useful information for me as a minority in AI and computing science and I think for everyone else as well. Uh, so now if anyone has a question, please write it in the chat. Well, thank you. It was fun putting this talk together. <laughs> So, yeah. Okay, until people uh, start asking questions, I, uh, I will ask some of my questions. Uh, so, you, you mentioned that uh, women in academia and in computing science, they are looked at as they are not as competent. Uh, and I myself came across uh, incidents when I say a comment or something and um, a lecturer uh, will smile, like, you know, this smile that yeah, what you're saying is stupid. Mm -hmm. And that will come back to me, making me feel even worse. And I thought I need to, to take an action. Like if someone does that, I should I don't know, react because that will help me later in my day and later in my life but I don't really know what kind of actions should I take when such a situation happens. Do you, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> well, yeah, like it, it's really difficult. And I mean, like the hard answer is the one to, you don't need to be in a space where you, you're treated like this. Like I, before I've come to Edinburgh, I worked in like a situation where my colleagues basically threw me under the bus because I was the lowest in hierarchy and I was also the only woman there and like they kind of set me up on a project to fail and that was like it really broke my heart so much like I was so pissed off and yeah I mean I could have called them out on it I could have like I mean I talked to kind of the higher up boss about this but it was ignored and so on and I think like the bottom line for me was like I should have left the situation earlier because there are places that treat you better and like sometimes you end up if it's like your PhD supervisor or if it's a job that you like really depend on where you feel like okay I have I have no alternative but yeah it's it's like really hard to say I don't know I'd say to myself in retrospect I should have left earlier but um, of course you can only say these things in retrospect so yeah I, I, I like I don't I don't have like a short-term solution so to say is they like okay if somebody like gives you a mean comment then uh that's the thing you need to do but it's it's more like on the grand scheme of things if these things pile up i think you need to be like clear to yourself like okay how much more of this can i take and i think like this is something that i also learned during my phd and so on to like have a better sense of like okay this is this is the level of bullshit that i can take before i walk away so yeah I don't know. Yeah, I, I know it's hard. Uh, the problem is those subtle things really contribute to my self-worth. I think everyone's self-worth. Uh, and if we leave them to happen more, more often, eventually we will not feel like we are strong enough to stand up for it or to leave the place or something. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's something, uh, something difficult. And uh, I have to say that the complaints um, strategy doesn't always work like you can't complain but nothing will happen yeah uh, most likely everything will stay the same um, so I think just need to care for our mental health uh, 
we just should be aware of that uh, yeah yeah i mean like caring for your mental health is so important and like another thing that i kind of learned during phd is also like just to find other areas that like are not necessarily your job or so if where you can like feel this sense of like ownership or competence if you can't always get that in other places so but yeah i think i think that's also like it's a dangerous thing to say like you have to endure in a toxic workplace just to take care of your mental health like it's i think it's really both things it's it's like being clear about yourself okay how much can i take and then like also making sure that you don't burn yourself out yeah but yeah okay waiting for more questions i will ask another question uh, so you mentioned uh, how important mentorship is but it's not easy to find a mentor <laughs> yes it's definitely yeah it is it's not easy to find a mentor like one thing that i i did is really uh, just reached out to my friends like i have like one of them like two of them are here <laughs> like when it, where uh like i um just reach out to like people that i i know in person for like kind of pure peer-to-peer -peer mentorship where i said like hey would you be up to like meet once a week or meet in the morning before we start our work day to just like talk about what we plan to do or like would you be up to like meet with me once a week and we talk about like work related stuff so kind of yeah if there are no formalized networks for mentorship then you have to kind of like go go this weird way and like create these things for yourself by by asking friends then but it's it's difficult like what if you don't have friends that like kind of qualify for this where you'd say like okay this would be a person where who i think has more experience like i don't know like again affinity groups like queer and ai or um winnell or like the other ones they have also kind of more or less formalized mentorship programs where you can team up with people so that's one other thing that i can like recommend maybe like reaching out to their Slack channels or their um, uh, mailing lists, or for example, like attending um, a social event that they're hosting and kind of like getting to know people that way. Um, yeah, like it's like the mentorship question is, is really difficult because like some universities will have kind of a formalized way to like just assign you a mentor if you like sign up for the program, but like it's hard to, to conjure that up from, from nothingness yeah and how would you promote yourself as a mentor um well like the the one like the one ment ment mentee relationship that i had was like because it was kind of set up by the women in stem society at my university where they just like kind of you had a questionnaire where you put in the things that you are competent in and uh, then they just like matched uh, undergrad student for you but um if you want to be a mentor like I mean, this, it, it can be a peer to peer thing, right, where you just like say in your friend's circle, like, hey, would you be up for talking about you, your career? And then it can be like, it's like a two sided thing where like, one time around, it's you like taking on the role of the mentor and kind of asking the question, walking through the problems. And then the other time, it, it's like your friend doing that for you. And th this way, it can be like, both sided thing. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know, like, then again, alumni networks are, are another thing where where this can happen if you like there there are some things i don't know um how like different universities handle this right like so i i only know from my personal experience that like some universities have like an alumni i don't know program where where, where you can do mentorship as well yeah. okay and um you talk early in your presentation that uh, you joined uh activities like bright club to get some confidence talking on stage but now this experience is really hard to to have because of the lockdown yeah so um do you have uh i don't know suggestions for alternatives <laughs> well i mean one thing we're doing here right now right like i mean just putting up like kind of a virtual space to talk to is is like when like lots of like kind of these talk series have shifted online so that's also kind of a benefit if you're like not living in a place where these things these things happen or if you're like not a uni at a university and so on it's now kind of easier because you have the access of like just going to meet up and like joining a meetup for example or um 
I think a similar thing about public speaking is Toastmasters. I've never joined that, but they also have like groups that are organized over meetups. And that is also kind of like a public speaking thing that's like not really like computer science or NLP focused at all, but that is like really just for people to practice their public speaking skills. And are you worried that when things go back to normal, if they go back to normal, it will be more difficult again to stand on a stage and face real audience? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, I have no idea what it will be like when it comes back to normal. Like, I, I, yeah, I think I have kind of a mental image of like, oh, when we're all like meeting in person again, it will be so and so. But I think I'm just like projecting from my own experience and it will, of course, be different. But yeah. Oh, um, somebody posted, can you talk more about your experience in the Bright Club? So yeah, I, I can, uh, Laura posted that um, in the chat. I think I can, I can say something about that. So the way I, I came to do this was just that like a friend of mine told me that she did it and it was fun. And I was like, oh yeah, I could try this. Um, and it is organized in Edinburgh quite informally. There is just like two or three people who have like this connection with the comedy club there where they like put this on, they do kind of the administrative thing and you meet up with them and whoever else signed up for the next rotation of it and you do like a few sessions where they just teach you how to structure um a set a, like a comedy set so this was really helpful for them for me to get like what is the structure what are kind of the the goal posts that i need to have in mind what does like how does funny even work how do i set up a story that i tell so that people will laugh at some point so that that was really cool and then you can like um yeah uh, start thinking about like okay what is it about my research that i care about that i want to put on the stage so people listen to it and take away some kind of message and um it it was like a really rewarding experience so um it's it's whenever like for me it was the hardest part was kind of writing the set and like setting everything up and being like okay it doesn't make sense and you need to like have some people as a sounding board where you can say like okay is this funny is this funny is this funny because like you totally don't know that yourself what what like somebody else would would consider a funny thing about computer science but yeah like it just like getting up on the stage and being there for those seven minutes that you have is is really cool because um yeah it, it's really a confidence booster because like you literally have a room full of people laughing at you at your jokes not at you they laugh at your jokes so it's it's really confidence building i, I can i can highly recommend it yeah you're welcome Okay, until we get uh, more questions, I have one more question to ask. Um, so um, I don't know if you have, um, if you like from your practice or you joining uh, different uh, affiliations like uh, Queer in AI, sometimes people start those kind of affiliations, but they don't really continue. Like they come together excited and they start setting up activities and then within a few months, it just fades away. Um, do you, do you have any advice how to keep it up? Yeah, like it's, it's definitely difficult. Like I've uh, had like different experiences with that. Like for example, with the art space that I ha have put up, it's like it, it had definitely like phases where like at the beginning we had like 20 or 30 people and then we were like down to five people and so on. So like it, there is like something like a seasonal flow but what I found kind of help is consistency so that you like just you do it every week or every month or like whatever your date is you advertise it every time and you're just like there the same time the same place and sometimes two people show up sometimes 50 people show up but like through through this consistency people just know that they can rely on it and and then they'll come back hopefully but also to just like keep keep on advertising um, and find, for example, different channels to advertise it as well. Like when the art space kind of died down, we like reached out more to social media. We set up like uh, an Instagram account and we like did did like these like little paper airplanes that I had on the 
slides that you can like throw around with like the dates and times of it and so on. So yeah, it it is it, it is a tricky question. Like like I ha I definitely experience it as well. Like with reading groups that I've like been part of, that like it kind of people are around for the first three chapters and then kind of flattens out. So I think like yeah, what what it have helps there is also having like a, a core of people that you can kind of rely on like those two or three friends that will just always show up <laughs> and that's that's also kind of good but yeah it's i think i think it's it's definitely a difficult question of like what keeps those things sustainable like for example queer and ai is just huge now but i think what keeps it going and what like kept its rise from like when it was created four years ago is that like there are a handful of people who are really into it and who are really there all the time and who make sure that like we have a social at every like nlp conference and like yeah i think again having more than just one or two people but having three or four that are kind of like a hardcore who are really motivated keep helps keeps these things going like i mean i would not have been able to do the art space if it wasn't like for my friend that I like did this with and like we would just show show up for it together and go and eat pizza afterwards and like if if two other people came it was okay because at least I got to hang out with my friend so <laughs> that that's I think if I can give any advice that that would be advice oh yeah uh okay google slide links I will do that so I'm a res I'm researching NL ML NLP now, and I'm new to this. Could you briefly say road map kind of thing? Resources. Run. So, um, what exactly do you mean by by road map kind of thing? Like, can you can you specify this? Um, because I think there are just many ways to go about things, and my my way of getting to where I am now was quite nonlinear and random. Like it looks now from from the perspective now it looks like it all makes sense but it was actually like kind of a zigzaggy thing and i i don't have like a clear trajectory of like oh yeah in two years i want to be the ceo of my own startup or what okay mm -hmm. so i mean they are so you say you're an undergrad so you definitely get like taking machine learning courses taking nlp learning courses is a great thing, place to start then doing internships at uh, companies that do NLP stuff is also great. Like um, I had kind of a part-time job during my master's, for example, where I got hands-on experience with coding NLP applications while getting kind of the theoretical background from, from being in class, which was really good, but also super stressful. Like I don't recommend people to have half-time jobs. <laughs> when they go to university but like sometimes that's what you have to do um so yeah like just take the courses that your university offers that they are like great things online like for example the the stanford nlp uh course like machine learning for natural language processing all of that is on youtube like if you just google stanford machine learning for for nlp course like their material is pretty good and then, yeah, I would recommend doing internships and figuring out what exactly, like, is the part of NLP that interests you most? What What is the, like, area that you want to go into? Or, like, again, affinity groups, um, Masahane, for example, um, they uh, do low resource machine translation or, like, low resource NLP applications and um, they have a really cool Slack channel and um, weekly meetups where they discuss the projects that they're in. And that's like a thing if you want to do um, some kind of coding work in your free time, just like as kind of a cool project to show off, for example, in your portfolio when you apply to places. Um, oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, that's, that's again, that's a really good place to start because people there are incredibly nice and and like enthusiastic and they're really happy about like anybody who can help them with things so that's yeah a huge recommendation to them as well 